Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is from Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. To say that Ellie's nerves were frayed would be an understatement. It all began, as always, a couple of weeks before Thanksgiving. You see, ever since her mother-in-law had passed away, the family traditions had been passed on to Jim. He was the oldest son, and so it just made sense to all the other kids. And because the family traditions had been passed to Jim, they had, of course, been passed to Ellie. And let me tell you, there were a lot of traditions between Thanksgiving and New Year's. Jim was an accountant at Bergman, Goldman, and Ribicow, the largest accounting firm in Baltimore. He was not only very good at his job, but he liked it. Jim and numbers just always got along. Ellie and Jim have two boys, Jimmy Jr. and Oliver. Jimmy is 12 and Oliver is 10. Along with all the larger family traditions that Ellie has to manage, there are the special holiday things going on, like the programs at school and the programs at church. Now, I don't want you to think that Jim is a bad guy and that he just dumped everything on Ellie. He's actually a very good man, and he does what he can to help. But the simple reality is that Jim spent at least an hour a day traveling back and forth from work, and that's when the traffic is good. And let's face it, Baltimore traffic between Thanksgiving and Christmas or New Year's is never good. So it always took longer for him. Then also, because he's an accountant, and it's the end of the year, all those businesses were filing their end-of-year tax forms and all that kind of stuff, so Jim often had to work late. On top of all this, Ellie is a school teacher. Now, this did mean that she got her vacation days right around the same time that the children always did, which was nice, except that it always meant that she had children with her when she was supposed to be preparing for all of these great family traditions. Anyway, she not only has to keep on top of the children, but all the new children programs and so forth. And so she had a lot of juggling to do. And then, of course, as a school teacher, she had all of those extra responsibilities that go on behind the scenes that simply increase during the holidays. Jim and the others could tell, and they did tell, that she was doing her best, and they would often tell her, Ellie, you're just doing a wonderful job. They wanted to encourage her and support her, right? But the more she heard such praise, the more that Ellie felt that there was pressure on her to keep doing a wonderful job. And so she just got more and more stressed out. In all of this craziness, the shopping, the decorating, the traditions, the cooking, the cleaning, the Christmas cards, the parties, and on and on and on, Ellie has but one true solace, music. She loves music. She loves all kinds of music. She loves rock and roll. She loves classical. She loves jazz. She loves country. She even likes rap. And if you were to check the stations on her car radio, you would discover that every station has a different style of music. And so whatever mood she was in, she could hit that station and she could get her fix of whatever it was. She also loves to sing. And she plays the piano. I mean, not great, but okay. Good enough for herself. And after all, that's the only person she has to please, right? 
So after a long day, she could just simply sit at her piano, open her hymnal, and play some tunes, and feel the cares of the day melt away. At least most of the time. This was the Christmas season. This was the stress season. This was the high expectation season. And playing those hymns just wasn't quite getting the job done. To make things worse, Ellie's frayed nerves were coming out in her relationships, and she knew it. She was getting snippy, to put it nicely, with her co-workers, her friends, her neighbors, even her family. And the children, they just didn't understand. I mean, Christmas, it's supposed to be the time of joy and happiness. And mom, mom always seems to be cross. Jim, of course, did understand, but he really couldn't do much to lighten her load. And even when he did try, even when he did what he could, right, he couldn't really lift that mountain off of Ellie. To her, it seemed to feel like Jim would, you know, take a shovel to a, a full of, or two of dirt off of this mountain and think like he had moved the whole mountain. But as Jim went back to work, there was that mountain of responsibility still there, the mountain that was crushing her. Those responsibilities to be seem to be all that the holidays were about these days. They pulled at her in every which way, draining her of her joy, her hope, her peace. Everyone else might be having a Merry Christmas, but Ellie wasn't. Now, this probably would sound unwise to you, and you might tell her not to do this, but it is exactly because of all of this stress and all of these responsibilities that Ellie decided to add one more commitment. She decided to join the church choir. Years and years ago, she had been a member, but the pressures of being a mother and a wife and a school te te teacher had just kind of pushed that out of her schedule, out of her life. And now, more than ever, she felt like she needed to sing. She needed to sing O Little Town of Bethlehem. She needed to sing Silent Night. And the choir would give her that chance. Now, they were members of Emmanuel Lutheran over in Cantonsville, which is about halfway between their home in Ellicott and Baltimore, where Jim worked. 15, 20 minutes most Sundays. So Saturday morning, when Jim was watching the boys, Ellie set out. Little did she know that Jim said a prayer for her. He prayed that the choir would help her find the peace and joy that she had somehow misplaced over the years. God certainly knew that Jim didn't know what to do. Ellie stepped into the choir room with that same prayer in her heart. As church choirs always are, they were delighted to have another voice especially someone with a voice like Ellie's. She sat down in the alto section and greeted many of her old friends that were still part of the choir, even though she hadn't been there in years. That happened to be that Bob, the day Bob, the choir director, told the choir his exciting news. He was just bubbling over. They would be doing for their Christmas program this year the Christmas portion of the Messiah! Hallelujah! Praise God! Ellie's heart began to race. She was all set to sing Old Little Town of Bethlehem, Silent Night, and so forth, but the Messiah? As great a piece of music as it was, this was no simple Christmas carol. She wouldn't be able to just relax and enjoy the fellowship and the singing, this would be real work. 
Bob went on. You know how choir directors are. He wanted them to sing the Messiah not simply as a great musical piece, which of course it is, and not as a great Christmas tradition, which of course it is, but with understanding. What was Handel trying to communicate? Choir went on with a singing through of the portions of the Messiah that they would be using, but Ellie and Bob, of course, was explaining everything as he went along, but Ellie was not hearing. The whole idea of singing the Messiah was overwhelming her. That night, Ellie said to Jim, I think I've bitten off more than I can chew with choir. They are planning to do the Messiah. The Messiah! I can't devote that kind of time to learn those parts. It is just too difficult for me with all the parties and all the planning and everything at school and the children. I'm just going to tell Bob this Sunday that I can't help. Now you've got to understand, Jim is a nice guy. And on almost any night of the year, he would have said, that's okay, honey, I understand, and let it go at that. But for some reason, something different happened this night. Maybe it was the Holy Spirit working. At any rate, Jim said, no way. You love singing, and what could be more important than singing to the Lord on Christmas. This choir program is more important than the parties or the Christmas cards or Christmas shopping or family dinners or whatever. I'm going to watch the children and you're going to sing and that's the end of it. Ellie was shocked. As I said, Jim was usually not quite this forceful to put it mildly. And so she, unexpected to having to stand up for something like this, buckled and said, I'll try. And that night she pulled out her copy of the Messiah and plunked out the alto part on the piano, still with a rather heavy heart. Next week the choir practice began, but he, Bob started following a different schedule. First he practiced the men, and then he would practice the ladies because there were parts that needed uh, only men and only women. Ellie arrived early because Jim was watching the kids. What can you say? And she saw a chance to get a bit of a break. And so she sat there listening as Bob worked with the men. And she had listened intently to how Bob explained the Messiah. When you sing, comfort ye my people, I want you to remember that the people being spoken of are not just the people of Isaiah's time, or even the time of Jesus. He is talking to people from every age, which includes today. Everyone who hears you should think, God is offering me comfort. And when you sing that Israel's warfare is over, I don't want you to think of people are running around with bows and arrows or even tanks and bombs. Isaiah means that our sin is pardoned. The warfare is against all that oppresses our souls. I want the people to think Christ has come to fight and win against what oppresses me in my soul, what robs me of the joy of the season, what drains me of life. Bob had caught Ellie's attention. He went on. The mountains that are brought down and the valleys that are filled up are not literal mountains and valleys, but the mountains and valleys of our lives the obstacles we can't overcome ourselves. Ellie thought of her holiday schedule for the first time 
not only as a mountain, but as a mountain that Jesus had come to level. He levels it with his sacrificial and giving love. By the time the men's practice was over, before the women even began, Ellie was thinking of the Messiah in a whole new way. Handel wasn't just telling a story about something great that happened a long, long time ago, like you might read about in a history book. He was writing about every day since the birth of Jesus. The Messiah wasn't just about comfort for some poor shepherds on a hill far, far away, but it was about comfort for her. During the women's rehearsal, Bob was just as clear about each part that the women would be singing. What really stuck in Ellie's mind were the words in the woman's part near the end of, of what they would be doing. Come unto him, all ye that labor. Come unto him that are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. Take his yoke upon you and learn of him, for he is meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. Bob said, I want you to sing this like it is an invitation to each person present to find rest. Rest in God. God is saying to each one who is inundated by the cares and concerns of the season that those people that are heavy laden at this time to find rest in Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who has come in meekness to bear their burdens and give rest in their souls. Individually, that is what they should all come away with that night. Because they were singing the Messiah, and there is one part of the Messiah that everybody knows, everybody knows comes from the Messiah, that's the Hallelujah Chorus, they were going to sing it also, even though it's really part of the Easter portion of the oratorio. And Ellie found that even this piece had much more meaning for her now. Instead of singing about how other people sang hallelujah, she was now truly singing hallelujah in her heart herself. She was feeling that the words of Mary were true for her as well. Not just that God had done great things, but that God had done great things for me. And that certainly merited a hallelujah or two. As Allie left choir practice, she realized that for the first time, maybe in a long time, she was enjoying Christmas. She turned off her car radio and began to hum the Messiah as she was driving home. Over the next few weeks, everyone noticed the change in Ellie. Ellie noticed it too. She circled Sunday, December 20th, on the calendar. That was the evening of the concert. She invited her neighbors, her friends, her family, even her co-workers, even the janitor and the kitchen staff at school. Ellie was praying that each one of them would not only enjoy the music, but that the words would reach them like the words had reached her. It was Saturday the 19th, the day before the concert, as Ellie was traveling to Emmanuel when disaster struck. The roads were slick, and a teenage boy in his truck lost control and was skidding straight towards Ellie. Being a good driver, she managed to avoid him, but in doing so went into a skid herself. And when all was said and done, she had collided with a telephone pole and was actually unconscious. The EMVs came and they took her to the closest hospital. And all in all, Ellie got away rather easy. She was, of course, severely bruised, and she had cuts from the broken glass. She did have a broken leg and a concussion, but when you consider what could have happened, 
pretty easy. When Jim visited her in the hospital that evening, he found her gently crying. His hug was court, cut short as Ellie winched from pain because of all of the bruises she had. Jim began to say, It's okay, sweetheart. You'll be out of here in no time. When Air Ellie tearfully said, But not in time to sing the Messiah. I know, honey, said Jim. But they'll be just fine without you. Ellie said, Jim, you just don't understand. Handel has given me back Christmas, and now I won't be able to give that gift to others myself. I, her voice just trailed off. There was nothing she could say, and Jim didn't know what to say. For the first time in weeks, a heaviness settled over both of them. Sunday came, the day of the concert, and Jim bundled the children off to school. I mean, to church. Of course, he had to tell Bob that Ellie wouldn't be singing, but he had an idea, something that just might cheer Ellie up. On the way home from worship, they stopped at the hospital. When Jim and the boy entered the room, the first thing he did was plug in a CD player and pop in a recording of the Messiah. Soon the opening strands of the Messiah began to fill the room and Ellie's face brightened. And then Jim said, Honey, would you sing your part of the concert for us right now? And she did, and she sang with all her heart. Some of the nurses came in and started to listen, and some of the other people that were visiting friends or family members came in and listened, and Ellie got a chance to share what the Messiah meant to her, how it meant that Jesus had come for her, had given her the meaning of Christmas back, that he had come to be her savior, the savior of her family, the savior of our friends, the savior of, of the friends of, you know, little Ollie and Jimmy, the savior of the people she worked with, the savior of the nurses. As Ellie put it, when the angel said, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior, which is Christ the Lord, the you is you, and me, and each one of us. That is the meaning of Christmas. That is what Handel reminded me of with his Messiah. Without that, all the parties and lights are simply ways to keep busy. With that message, the parties and light actually become a true celebration of God with us. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.